Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Tyler Sloat. Tyler is Chief Financial Officer at Freshworks, where he oversees accounting, finance, and IT. Tyler is a seasoned cloud finance leader and board member and has played a pivotal role in several successful IPOs and acquisitions. Previously, Tyler was CFO at Zuara, where he led the company from startup through IPO in 2018. Before Zuara, Tyler held executive finance roles at a series of technology leaders, including NetApp, Inc., and Siebel Systems. Has been a board member for several companies, including Rwanda and Compass, and currently is an advisor and direct investor to a variety of private companies. He holds an MBA from Stanford and a CPA in the state of California. Tyler, thanks for being my guest today. Megan, thank you for having me. Yeah, today we're going to be discussing a bit about you and your career and what led you to your current position with Freshworks. Then we'll turn the conversation specifically to Freshworks, which recently underwent an exceptionally successful IPO and is just generally a great success story that should inspire millions. I'm really excited to hear your story, Tyler, as well as the fresh work story. So let's get started. Awesome. First, tell me about your career progression and how it is that you got to where you are today. I think uh, like a lot of college students out there, I had no idea what I wanted to do in school. I was actually an econ major with uh, pre-dental, um, so, which was the same as pre-med. Um, but I got a job graduating and interviewed with a bunch of companies, including like sales roles and all this kind of stuff, and ended up getting a job with Coopers and Librand, uh, which was, you know, one of the big six at the time, uh, which is now PricewaterhouseCoopers, and started in their computer insurance services group. Worked in Boston with them for an hour, but that was like IT internal controls before SOCs existed. Can't say I really had a great grasp on what I was doing, but I think I did okay. Um, and then transferred out to the San Jose office and I transferred into the audit group. And I remember sitting in a car reading a fundamentals of accounting book because I'd never had an accounting class before. <laughs> um, and honestly learned on the job because I got put on like five deals back to back, you know, either IPOs or M&As. So I was working a ton and I <clears throat> pretty quickly realized I also needed to, to educate myself. So I enrolled in a night class at San Jose State. And then I convinced Coopers to send me what they called Coopers Academy, which was like a eight week intensive program at USC uh, that gave me all the accounting credits I needed for a CPA. Um, and, and, you know, worked there long enough to get a CPA in terms of experience and then kind of just entered industry from there. And accounting is one of these things that either you kind of get it or you don't. Um, and uh, I started as a, you know, general accounting manager and quickly appointed controller of a company called Poet Software. That was a private business that we ended up taking public kind of pre-dot-com days. And that afforded me the opportunity to go back to business school, which I did, which was awesome. And from there, just kind of had this journey in Silicon Valley. And I don't know if it's luck or uh, by grace that, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to have some great roles, start at Siebel Systems, but just kind of Six weeks into the job at Siebel, they asked me if I wanted to go run finance for this new division they were starting, which was called Siebel On Demand. And it was to compete with this little company that just started called Salesforce. And we bought two companies. And, you know, I, I, as my first foray into to SaaS and figuring out everything, you know, how those businesses were run, which was completely different than Siebel's business. And I ended up staying at Siebel probably a year and a half more than I, I thought I would because of that. And then went to a, a private hardware and encryption business called the crew. And we ended up selling that much earlier than I thought we would. I ran finance there and operations and we sold it to NetApp uh, about nine months after I got there. Then given the opportunity to be the controller of the emerging products group at NetApp. And I don't know, every kind of series of events where I've chosen a company I, I go through this quick analysis, I call it like, it's, it's kind of dumb, but I call it the five finger analysis. I go, okay, what's, what's the market? Uh, and you know, what's the problem in that market is the first. And then second, what product is being brought to solve that problem? 
And third, what is the team that's building the product to go solve that problem? And then fourth, are, who are the investors backing the team to build the product to go solve that problem? And then lastly, what is the role? And I, I put it in that order and I kind of just go through that. And, you know, that's how I found DeCrew. I stayed at NetApp for a couple of years, which was really fun. Um, then I found a company called Obopay, which had a huge uh, market opportunity. I just think it was too early, but I was a CFO there. It was my first CFO gig. Uh, then from Obopay, that's where I landed at Zora. And that ended up being a almost 10-year journey, which was really fun. Um, and I decided to leave Zora, and that's where I found Freshworks. Um, and that's kind of where I, how, I, how I got here. And you know, I've had plenty of friends who've worked at a lot of private companies in Silicon Valley and never really had an opportunity to go experience one that had incredible growth. So I consider myself blessed. Yeah. It sounds like you've had some great adventures along the way. And, and I like that five finger method. Sounds like it's led you to some great choices. <laughs> it's pretty simple, <laughs> but it, I think it works. Yeah. And, and funny, I was actually a pre-med major too, before deciding on accounting. Uh, yeah. and I couldn't it's, pass it's organic chemistry. Way, it's, a, it's an incredible way to destroy a GPA. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> So as you look back on your career, are there stories or moves that stand out in your mind as turning points? Yeah, I think I look, I look back at those, those companies I was at, and I think the one that like wasn't, so I've been with five private companies um, and three of them now, you know, have gone public. One of them was sold. Uh, and then the last was this company, Obopay. But Obopay was actually my first CFO job and really drove me to like really own a bunch of stuff. So I owned kind of our, our business development efforts there and we didn't have any direct sales. So it was all through partnerships. I ran all the financials because I was a CFO. Uh, I also ran our treasury operations, which was the movement of all of our, uh, all of our customers' money. Um, and that was really exciting because we we're just a little company and we we're doing like a ton of really big deals. Uh, but it also like really educated me on the the inverse perspective of how like really large companies because like we did we had pretty big deals with Citibank, Mastercard, Societe Generale, Nokia, um, and how you know those companies really you know what they can do to a small company if that small company isn't ready, and I just had a ton of learnings through that, um, and also realized then that. You know, the one thing is the market was too early, but our, our products just, they weren't built to scale. And we had such a big vision, but it didn't match the, the product that we were bringing to market. And I look at that and I look at the piece parts from all my other experiences. And, and that was the biggest learning that came back. Things like companies can get so far with marketing and vision. But the reality is it'll all catch up if you don't have the product and technology. And if you don't stay true to building products the right way and really, you know, focusing on the customer, uh, it's going to catch up to you. And, uh, and that, I think, is probably my biggest learning of all the companies I've been with. Uh, and honestly, one of the reasons I, I ended up choosing Freshworks. Yeah, I feel like so many companies lose sight of the customer at the end of the day. Yeah, and at the reality, you, you, you lose that of the customer, but maybe you do so because you're making decisions for other customers, but you lose sight of the, the customer, the, the, the macro customer voice, right? What do, what, do, like, what do all customers need as opposed to one or two? Yeah. And if you design for the masses, then and you, you know, you, and you make it so that your product is easy to use for the masses, then it then you inevitably will just serve so many more. Um, and then you can always just tweak and, and make it a little bit more flexible toward the end. But if you go down a path of designing for rigid systems, uh, you're going to get stuck, right? We really minimize that market, that first finger that you just narrow out that market. Um, the other place I saw this was Siebel, right? Where Siebel had, you know, on-premise, they'd, you know, created an entire category called CRM, uh, but with these big, heavy uh, software uh, engagements that they're living and dying by the $20, $30 million deal every quarter. And then they tried to create an on-demand product, a SaaS product, um, 
by really kind of just thinking they could take that hit, big, heavy system, throw it in almost like an ASP model and host it for folks and get small companies to use it. And, you know, they weren't listening to it. They weren't really paying attention at all to what customers wanted in that space. And it was just, that was a great learning as well. Just like exactly what not to do um, in, in that kind of environment. Yeah, sometimes those are the best learnings. And uh, speaking of design for the masses and easy to use, tell us about Freshworks, um, maybe a bit about their history, their mission, and what it is they do. Yeah, so at Freshworks, you know, we design products for the end user. And what that means is you're, you're really thinking about the, the person, the individual who's doing their day-to-day -day jobs in your product. So Freshworks started as Fresh Desk, which is our, our biggest product now. Uh, and it's, you know, customer support software at its core, allowing our customers to engage with their customers. Uh, but building that software, you know, and now innovating on it for over 10 years, while still staying true to the DNA of building for the end user. So what does that mean? It means that the software has to have an incredible user experience, has to have uh, a great UI, uh, has to be really easy to navigate. And really importantly, it has to be, you know, a really fast uh, ROI. I mean, like it should be very easy to get started uh, and start using. Um, <clears throat> over time, Freshworks, you know, started with Freshdesk, then saw a bunch of customers using the Freshdesk product for internal IT purposes. And then the realization, well, they don't really, they need a purpose-built product for that. And so we built Fresh Service. Uh, and then, you know, as we continue the journey, realizing that there's going to be this desire for our customers to be able to see the entire life cycle of their customer's journey with them. So we have, we built Fresh Marketer and Fresh Sales uh, and have fresh, fresh Success as well to do this customer kind of 360 view. And so it's really cut products, Freshworks has products that help our customers delight their customers and have products that help our customers delight their employees. So they're kind of inverse facing, you know, fresh service and fresh teams help our customers, you know, work, uh, engage with their employee base, fresh sales, fresh marketer, fresh dash, fresh, fresh desk, fresh success, help our customers engage with their customers. Bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> that is, say it fast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so what differentiates fresh works from their rivals such as salesforce.com and and do you guys have an ideal customer we don't have an ideal customer i'll answer the second part first because you know we're not verticalized uh we have customers you know from the long tail of smb so you know really small customers all the way up to this mid-market enterprise business um we don't go after what we call elephant hunting if you are a very large enterprise that wants to heavily customize uh, the software that you're buying um, and really, you know, kind of almost make it a consulting project as opposed to out of the box uh, software, that, that's not for us. Uh, and we actually would walk away from those deals. Uh, we've created a product that it can be, you know, uh, extended with a ton of applications and kind of open APIs, but it's not built to be kind of uh, custom built or cust uh, customized incredibly. The difference between us and our competitors, and you mentioned Salesforce, is that, you know, when Salesforce started, it was, it, it probably had a very similar DNA that it was built for small companies, supposed to be really easy to use, uh, really easy to navigate. And they were competing with on-premise at the time. So it wasn't like a, uh, a huge hurdle to, to make that distinction. Yet over time, I think a lot of the SaaS companies that started early have you know, fallen prey to the desire to go serve those mega companies and really go after those mega deals and as such, They've, you know, they've had their product roadmaps hijacked. They now have these just kind of uh, massive code bases that are just really tough to navigate and products that are really hard to, to use and aren't actually self-service anymore. Whereas Freshworks has stayed true to the DNA of building for the end user, stayed true to the kind of those core concepts of great usability and UI, but really fast to onboard. Uh, 
And then over time, just added feature functionality that now our products are relevant to that mid-market enterprise customer base because they have the feature functionality they need, but we've also stayed true to that DNA. And that's that's hard to do. And you know, if you actually look at software companies out there today, SaaS companies included, like I would challenge anybody to, to name a company that started with the big enterprise and built products for them, but successfully moved down to service the long tail of SMB. Uh, versus the companies who kind of have started by building products for the SMB and then just slowly moved up as their products became relevant to those larger organizations. And, and that's what Freshworks has done. And that's why we're different. Yeah, I'm sure those huge enterprises can be enticing, but I, I guess sometimes you have to sell your soul for, for those opportunities. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, you know, it's arguably short-sighted as well. And what are your proudest accomplishments since joining Freshworks? I think... I mean, your immediate thought goes to the IPO, but the IPO is just an event, right? And it's an event that was earned over a long period of time. I think my proudest process accomplishment right now is uh, the team that we've built here uh, over the last year and a half and, and the individuals that we've brought on board, but also the, uh, the readiness that we instilled within the organization and uh, you know, to become a, a public company, you have to, um, you need to have operational readiness uh, and kind of execution readiness. And operational readiness is you got to be able to, you know, close your books on time. You have to be able to do it accurately. You have to have systems that can help scale and, and help the company operate. And you need to have compliance. Uh, execution readiness is that you need to be able to do what you say you're going to do. And you have to be able to forecast your business. Uh, and you have to be able to see a little bit around corners uh, in order to operate like a, like a public company. And I think we have worked really, really hard for the last uh, two years to, to get us to a point that we were comfortable to, uh, in going public. And I know we've mentioned it a few times now, but Freshworks recently underwent an IPO. And, and why was this so significant or historic? There's a lot of software companies going public. They're, we are the first SaaS company founded out of India. And to be clear, we're a U.S. company and have been since day one, but we're really founded out in India and our, our heartbeat is in Chennai. Uh, and we're, we're the first company uh, to really you know, build itself uh, with India as its core to go public in the United States, uh, first kind of SaaS software company. And it's historic because we look at it as kind of this turning point where, uh, number one, we can be an example for so many other, uh, you know, software companies coming out of India. But in general, as G would like to say, his dream is to turn India into a product nation. And I think historically, uh, it, India has probably been viewed as more a, a headcount arbitrage uh, play through services uh, and you know consulting or uh, off, uh, uh, kind of shared services or outsourcing, uh, where that you know we are a, a product business uh, and the capability to build world class software uh, out of India is I think pretty special. Yeah, I love India. It's one of my my favorite countries, and I'm sure this has inspired you know millions of entrepreneurs there. And and I find them, I find um, India as a country to be so innovative. Mm -hmm. So, yep, very excited uh, that that you guys were successful in doing this. And um, so, why why the decision to go public in the U.S. rather than than maybe in India? Yeah, I don't think there was ever uh, a debate. Uh, even a conversation of do you go public in, in India versus U.S. I mean, we are, we're a U.S. company, first of all. Uh, we have, you know, primarily U.S. investors. Uh, and, but most importantly, it is, you know, it, if it's probably the toughest place to go public in the world. Uh, yeah. And, it, it, you know, the rigor that's required, the maturity that's required, but the validation that's provided, uh, it, you know, I, I don't think can be uh, can be rivaled. And so uh, for that, you know, we kind of earn the right through the metrics that we have, through the business that's been built uh, and the expectations that we have in front of us 
Um, I don't think it was ever a question of whether it was uh, someplace else other than U.S. It was more of a question of, okay, is this the right time? Yep. And and what made this the right time? I think it has to do more with the operational readiness and the execution readiness that I mentioned before, because there are companies who are public, SaaS companies who are public, who are smaller than us, who don't have the operational metrics that we do, meaning that we have this kind of, I'd say this rare combination of scale, right? Being over 300 million growth, you know, in that kind of 40% range, uh, but also efficiency where we actually produced cash uh, in the last 12 months, where there are companies that have gotten to scale and efficiency, but most of them, at, you know, kind of in our peer set would probably be burning a lot of capital to do so. Uh, and, you know, we've been able to do it efficiently. Uh, and I think that is, you know, because of that, you know, we already had those numbers. And so I think we had already earned the right to go public based off of those metrics. The question is, were you able, were, were we able to operate like a public company? Uh, and that's what the work we've been doing. And, you know, it, it felt like, okay, we are now ready because uh, we've, we've been, we've put in that infrastructure. Um, and so, but the metrics were already there. So that's why the timing came. And you also led Zuora through a successful IPO. So how did this experience differ? Yeah, for me personally, it was different because I joined Zuora when we had about, you know, 4 million in revenue. Uh, and over time, you know, I'd like to think I helped build the company. Uh, I, I managed every function at Zora at one point or another, except for engineering. Um, and then over time, it, the other thing we did was we Zora created a different, a new category, uh, a category that really didn't exist prior. So there's a lot of education on not just, you know, was the category going to have a TAM that would be relevant for a company to survive as a public entity, but also would Zora be the winner of that TAM, uh, you know, once that TAM presented itself. I didn't build Freshworks. I, I helped get Freshworks ready. I, um, I'm going to help build it going forward. Uh, but you know, Freshworks had already been on a 10-year journey almost. Uh, and secondarily, Freshworks wasn't creating any new categories. Uh, we're just building software a little bit different in the existing categories that, uh, that are already there. And so those are the two main differences for me personally, as well as kind of for the companies. And as you look out over the next two to three years, what are your specific goals for the company? Our goals are to keep growing. I mean, it's, it's actually not, um, for us, it's not complicated. It's all about execution. Because as I just mentioned, our, our markets are already there. And it's really how do we have the discipline to stay true to what we've been doing for the last 10 years and the way we build our software, but then continue to execute on how we're bringing that software to market and then once we have customers, how we engage with them. Uh, secondarily, a lot of my job is focused on making sure the company can support that growth, uh, both you know, through our own human capital, but, but you know, in our infrastructure and everything else, uh, and you know, scale globally. Uh, and, that, and that's what we're going to be focused on for the next couple of years. And I'm always interested to know, as a CFO, are there any tools or technologies that you or your team are using right now to, to help make your life easier in the workplace? We do use all of our own Freshworks software, which I think is important. I think it's really important for software companies to either drink your own champagne or eat your own dog food, however <laughs> you want to refer to it. Um, we have, you know, part of the readiness that we went through over the last year was putting in an entire back, you know, back office stack. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, new financial systems, uh, new, uh, systems that surround those financial systems. Um, I think for CFOs today, one of the most important things is data and the integrity of data. Uh, and then kind of with integrity goes the control of that data, uh, and then being able to get data to the businesses so that you can make decisions uh, for the business. And so we've spent a lot of time working on operational flows uh, and then what data is created during those flows and then capturing that data so that we have the right information to help run the business. Uh, and that, that's probably one of the, the bigger areas that we focus on right now. 
Yeah, so much data out there these days, but actually making mm-hmm. good use of it is, is, I guess, sometimes more difficult than just having access to it. Exactly. Data for the sake of data doesn't help anything, right? But yep. actually, data that helps inform decisions is really powerful. And obviously, we're living in pretty tumultuous times right now. But as a CFO, what what keeps you up at night? I think if you ask G, it's like, when can you get back in the office? Because he, he's focused on culture and whatnot so much. And, and I am as well. But I think for us, it's just uh, what's going to keep me up at night is continued execution and making sure that as a company, you know, we're placing the right bets. Uh, and, you know, it's my job to help, you know, help the company, you know, make decisions uh, and uh, to help the management team make decisions. And, you know, that, that's, just, that's just you wake up every day and you, you try to make a little bit more progress on continuing to build the next great software company. And lastly, if our listeners take just one thing away from this episode, what would you like it to be? One, uh, I guess one thing uh, first is just that for any technology company, the, the thesis that is that it always comes down to the product and the technology and the rigor that you have in building. Uh, but two, that uh, the way we operate as organizations today, that, you know, companies are truly global. And if you look at what Freshworks has been able to do, founded out of India, you know, with the majority of our employee base in India, but to be able to, you know, really reach the success and scale that we have, but also doing it truly on a global basis, I think it is a, is a somewhat of a wake up call that the traditional traditional method of founding your company in Silicon Valley, hiring all your engineering here, uh, starting your sales in North America, and then slowly moving to Europe and moving on, you don't have to do that. Uh, in fact, there's much more efficient ways to do it uh, a little bit differently. And I think you're going to, and we're going to see a lot more of that uh, going forward. So I think it's it's pretty exciting time. Yeah, I, l- I love that. And it's such an amazing story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being my guest today, Tyler. Absolutely, Megan. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really enjoyed speaking with you and I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. It sounds like you and Freshworks are doing exceptionally well and I wish you both continued success. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personif. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personif can do for you by visiting personif.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personif. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personif.com. Thanks for listening.